Hi, this is BTTV. In the year 2018, the World Bank described China's growth as the fastest sustained expansion by a major economy in history. In 2021, the World Bank also reported China's growth rate to be 8.1%. And while the country's gross domestic product or GDP doubles every eight years, 800 million Chinese are being raised out of poverty. On a purchasing power parity basis, China has thus become the world's largest economy. China has also now become the biggest holder of foreign exchange reserves, merchandise trader and the biggest manufacturer, thus making China one of the wealthiest nations on earth. So, how did a once impoverished and economically isolated nation, with an overly state-controlled economy, and a population made up of 80% farmers manage to turn around to become one of the world's most influential powers? This episode of Business and Technology is the first in two of mini-series aimed at helping us get a deeper understanding as to how China actually got rich. So subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications to not miss any of the episodes of this mini docu series. This is BTTV. The boast in productivity is one of the primary reasons for the economic boom China is currently enjoying. Productivity here referring to how efficient workers are. But a previously perfect command economy where the state was in total control and influenced prices on the market and blocked foreign investment into the country would at the break of dawn of the year 1978 through a series of free market orientated reforms relax its grip on the economy. Despite the huge expenditure of capital, the Chinese government noted that goods and services per unit of capital remained about the same. And even though these capital investments like manufacturing factories, machines, infrastructure and new technologies were all vital in increasing output, the Chinese government would quickly realize through the 1978 economic reforms that productivity gains through an efficient labor force was twice as important. This would account for over 42% of China's growth in between 1979 to 1994 and for over 50% of output growth by the early 1990s. These market-oriented reforms paid attention to productivity so much so that the share of capital formation in the country's output growth fell below 33% that same era. This wasn't the case pre-1978 where capital formation alone accounted for over 65% of the growth by then. With these reforms, the government would go ahead to introduce profit incentives to small private traders, family farms and rural collective enterprises. Collective enterprises were enterprises owned by local governments but which were guided by market principles. Foreign investors who were barely allowed into the country pre-1978 also enjoyed these profit incentives. Profit incentives had a positive impact on all those who benefited from them as these business owners could now retain and plow back more into their respective businesses and improving performance. At the realization that its policy of economic isolation wasn't doing the economy much good, the communist economy of China would embark on a growth strategy that saw the reduction in government control and intervention in the economy. Obviously, this paid off as the share of state-owned enterprises to national output dropped from 56% to 40%, while those of private businesses rose to 10%, up from 2%. And that of collective enterprises rose from 42% to 50%. It is worth noting that before this 1978 reforms, 80% of Chinese were into agriculture. And that by 1994, the figure had dropped to 50%. The reforms also helped expand property rights in the suburbs and countryside and touched off a race to form small non-agricultural businesses in rural areas. With the collectivization and the soaring of prices of agricultural products, family farms would become more productive and their labor forces more efficient. 
The Chinese government, through this 1978 free market reforms, would also give greater autonomy to managers of businesses to set their own production goals, sell at competitive prices in the open market, grant bonuses to efficient workers and retaining some portion of the company's earnings for future investment. With the greater room for private ownership of production, consumer products would be manufactured, hard currencies would be earned through foreign trade, and a lot more jobs would be created. The open-door policy promulgated by the 1978 reforms added weight to the economic transformation, as it would now favor foreign investment. Foreign investment that would hit 100 billion in the 1990s, up from being negligible prior to the year 1978, and would help build factories, create jobs, link China to international markets and led to important transfers of technology. The liberalization of the economy boasted export and would help the country's export grow by 19% yearly during 1981-94. This strong export would be recognized as the reason for a boom in productivity in local industries. Today China is a major commercial partner of many countries across the globe. And through its One Belt, One Road initiative and its Made in China 2025 economic plan which, by the way, will both be expatiated in the next episode of this docu-series announced respectively in 2013 and May 2015, the Asian nation plans to keep its domineering stance in global trade and politics, a domineering position that is placing China at the most favorable position of the bargaining table when it comes to doing business with Africa and getting all the ingredients in needs from the continent of Africa to remain rich and sustainable. With this we come to the end of the first episode of this mini docu-series. Thank you for watching. If you still haven't subscribed to the channel, please do, and turn on notifications to not miss out on the continuation of this series or other any other video. Until we meet again, take care. This is BTTV.